Shalom. Uh, welcome. I'm Rabbi Scott with Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida. We are reissuing the Revelation series that was taught by Rabbi Jim Pickens here at Beth Yeshua over the course of the last two years or so. We feel these messages are especially relevant in these tumultuous times, and we hope and pray that Adonai uses them uh, to strengthen you uh, and, and to encourage you. If you are currently a supporter of this ministry, we would like to say thank you. We appreciate your partnership with us as we all labor together in the work of the gospel of Yeshua uh, in the kingdom here on earth. Uh, if you would like to support us, you will find a link uh, below in uh, the video description. Once again, uh, we hope uh, that this is a blessing to you. If you have any questions, you will find an email address. Uh, if you have any dialogue or discussion, you'll find an email address in the video description below. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, now uh, I will give you the Revelation series with Rabbi Jim Pickens. Shalom. All right, good evening. We're going to pick this up with the blowing of the seventh shofar, Revelation 11.15. This is the third woe, or the third world judgment. When the seventh shofar is blown, an announcement is made that with this shofar blowing, Messiah will inherit the kingdom and the world. We will need to note that the word kingdom here is singular. Messiah will inherit a world kingdom, a one world kingdom, that which was created and put together finally by the false Messiah. A further announcement is made that at the time of final judgment has come, in order to destroy the ones that are destroying the earth and to avenge the ones that are killing the prophets and the holy people. These announcements are also declaring the results of the bold judgments. Just as the seventh seal judgment contained the shofar judgments, the seventh shofar judgment contains the seven bowl judgments. What we're going to look at tonight is a brief summary that the text uses to introduce the seven bowl judgments. Chapter 11 closes with the statement that the seven bowl judgments are about to be poured out. 11.14 says the second woe has passed. See that? The third woe is coming. It's coming quickly and gives a summary of what's coming. Chapters 12 and 13 gives a very brief history of the past and points to the events on the earth necessitating the bold judgments that are contained in this seventh shofar. Mainly the actions of the counterfeit God, his false messiah, and his false prophet. Revelation shows how the programs of these three will fail and begins to announce the bold judgments. Chapters 15 and 16 then describes the bold judgments. And there's a lot of detailed information in these next five chapters, but I'm going to try to move through them in a reasonable amount of time. I don't want to leave anything out, but I feel an urgency to begin teaching on the prophecies that must still fall prior to the beginning of the seven-year period. Yeshua taught us that we should be aware of the signs of the times and the occurring prophetic actions. And I want us to note that the occurring prophetic actions are signs of the times. The prophetic actions are signs of the times. And I feel an urgency to be teaching these. So I'm targeting August, really, to wrap up this study and move on to the next. So... Let's, let's begin by reading Revelation 11.15, please. It says, The seventh angel sounded his shofar, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will rule forever and ever. The seventh shofar contains the seven bowl judgments, which some believe are, is a, the directly poured out wrath of God. Think about that. Seven shofar contains the seven bowl judgments, which some believe is the directly poured out wrath of God. And we've looked at this. 
What has happened to this point is largely the responsibility of the wrath of man and the direct intervention of the demonic forces. This series of bold judgments, though, are then the direct intervention of God in judgment of the world. The response to the blowing of the seven shofar is loud voices in heaven. Think about that. The response to the blowing of the seventh shofar is loud voices in heaven. The source of the voices is not identified, but most scholars attributed these voices or attribute these voices to angelic beings. The voice tells of a transition which Yeshua acknowledged to his Talmudim following his resurrection on the first coming. Let's go to Matthew 28, verses 16 through 18, please. So the eleven Talmudim went to the hill in the Galilee where Yeshua had told them to go. Understand here there's just eleven. Judas has gone away. He's not part of the, the disciples anymore. Verse 17, when they saw him, they prostrated themselves before him, but some hesitated. Yeshua came and talked with them, and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, Yeshua made this statement 2,000 years ago, and shortly after that ascended into heaven in the cloud. That was not the time of the transition, though. Only that this authority had been given to him. Three and a half years earlier, that authority was vested in someone else. Go to Luke chapter 4. This is immediately after the immersion of Yeshua and the imparting of the Spirit on him and at the end of his 40-day fast in the wilderness before beginning his ministry here on earth. Luke 4, verses 5 through 7. The adversary took him up, showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and just as an aside, I think he may have showed him the kingdoms that were all ultimately going to belong to him at the end of the age. And verse 6, And said to him, that's Yeshua, I will give you all this power and glory. It has been handed over to me, and I can give it to whomever I choose. So if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Now, he's throwing this in the face of, of Messiah Yeshua. Since the fall of man, since the fall of man, until that time right there, the kingdoms of the world had been handed over to Hasatan, to Satan. From the time that man abducted the authority given to him over the earth in the garden until this event in Luke 4 took place, the kingdoms of the world had been the domain or kingdom of Satan, and he could give them to whoever they wanted to if they would worship him. Except that his authority wasn't absolute. See what Yeshua says in response to this, Luke 4, 8, please. Yeshua answered him, the Tanakh, Old Testament, says, Worship Adonai your God and serve him only. That's what our Messiah said directly to the face of Satan. Yeshua ends up with all authority on earth given to him because of his obedience to God, but the transition doesn't take place at this time, at this encounter. Yeshua ascends into heaven instead of to the throne at this point. The term of the adversary's rule over the world, though, now has a time limit placed on it. But the transition date is still sometime in the future. Asatan can still give rule to who he chooses until the time of transition. And he's done so down through the ages. Saddam Hussein. Idi Amin Dada, Stalin, Hitler, just a couple of names that we might know. The coming false messiah will also be someone that Satan will be able to give the authority of the world to. The coming false messiah who will control the world briefly. Then there will be the transition to the messianic kingdom, the messianic kingdom of a thousand years. The rulership of the world will then be transferred false messiah of the false god will be in place ruling over the whole world. That's when the adversary will have reached the absolute pinnacle of the power that's been allotted to him, and that's when the God of Israel will step in and transfer rulership of the world to his messiah, 
And in this, God and his Messiah will then be glorified over all others. Remember what God says in Ezekiel 36. I'm not going to do this for your sake, house of Israel, but for the sake of my holy name. When his adversary has reached the pinnacle of his power, God will simply sweep him away, but not until that time. So the transition of power to Yeshua doesn't take place at the time of Matthew 28:18, but at the time indicated by Revelation, by Revelation 11:15, at the blowing of the seventh shofar, the seventh shofar containing the seven bowls the pouring out of God's judgment on the kingdom of the world, which at that point will become the kingdom of our Lord and Messiah, beyond which our Lord and his Messiah will rule forever and ever. This is what's talked about in Daniel 7, which is one of the reasons we studied Daniel before we studied the Revelation. Daniel is having this vision, or has this vision, about the four Gentile kingdoms, the fourth of which had ten horns, and three of the ten horns were taken over by a little horn, which brings us down to where we are in Revelation. Uh, let's read Daniel 7, uh, 11 through 14, please. I kept watching, then because of the arrogant words which the horn was speaking, I watched as the animal was killed, its body was destroyed, and it was given over to be burned up completely. As for the other animals, their rulership was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a time and a season. I kept watching the night visions when I saw coming with the clouds of heaven someone like a son of man. He approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence. To him was given rulership, glory, and kingdom, so that all peoples, nations, and languages could serve him. His rulership is an eternal rulership that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is talking about when he arises, leaves the earth and goes into heaven and comes into the presence of God. He has to leave the world after his first coming and come back into the presence of God before he is granted this. Now, on the next page, Daniel seven twenty three through 27, please. This is what he said. The fourth animal will be the fourth kingdom on earth. It will be different from the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trample it down, and crush it. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and yet will another will arise after them. Now he will be different from the earlier ones, and he will put down three kings. He will speak against the Most High and try to exhaust the Holy Ones of the Most High. He will attempt to alter the seasons and the law, and the holy ones will be handed over to him for time, times, and half a time. But when the court goes into session, he will be stripped of his rulership, which will be consumed and completely destroyed. Then the kingdom, the rulership, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. Their kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all the rulers will serve and obey them. Messiah now owns this kingdom and he gives it over to the holy people. Hold on to that thought. Messiah now owns this kingdom and he gives it over to the holy people. This is speaking of that time in Revelation eleven fifteen is indicating. This is speaking of this time of transition. The evil of rebellion is to be crushed forever and the reign of Messiah is to be forever and ever. Hang on to that. The evil of rebellion is to be crushed forever and the reign of Messiah is to be forever and ever. Moving ahead now. Still in Revelation 11, let's look at verses 16 and 17. The 24 elders sitting on their thrones in God's presence fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we thank you, Adonai, God of heaven's army, the one who is and was, that you have taken your power and begun to rule. Pay attention to what it's saying in that verse 17. We thank you, Adonai, God of heaven's army, the one who is and was, that you have taken over your power and begun to rule. These 
are the same 24 elders that were introduced back in chapter 4, sitting on the throne surrounding the throne of God. The last time they were mentioned was in Revelation 7, 13 through 15, please. One of the elders asked me, these people dressed in white robes, who are they and where are they from? Sir, I answered, this is uh, John speaking, you know. And then he told me, these are the people who have come out of the great persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. That is why they are before God's throne. Day and night they serve him in his temple, and the one who sits on the throne will put his Shekinah, his glory, upon them. Back up further to Revelation 4, 4 through 11, please. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothing and wearing gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came forth lightnings, voices, and thunderings, and before the throne were seven flaming torches, which are the sevenfold Spirit of God. In front of the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living beings covered with eyes in front and behind. The first was like a lion, the second living was like an ox, the third living had a face like a human, and the fourth living was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living beings had six wings and was covered with eyes inside and out, and day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is Adonai, God of heaven's army, the one who was, who is, and who is coming. Notice that last verse. That's a little different than the one I asked you to look at before. Yes. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, to the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before the one sitting on the throne who lives forever and ever and worship him. They throw their crowns in front of the throne and say, You are worthy, Adonai Elohim, to have glory and honor and power because you created all things. Yes, because of your will, they were created and came into being. Look at Revelation 1.8. I am the A and the Z, says Adonai, the God of heaven's army, the one who is and who was and who is coming. Now go back to Revelation 11.17. Saying, we thank you, Adonai, God of heaven's army, the one who is and was, that you have taken your power and have come and began to rule the one who is and was, but he is no longer coming. He has arrived. That's what this is telling us here. This is the time that has been spoken of. Look at that next phrase. You have taken your power and affect your rulership and have begun to rule. This will be permanently. This is the Initiation of God's reign being established on earth through his Messiah and the 24 elders sitting on their thrones in God's presence fell on their faces and worshiped God. The tenses in the Greek language indicate this is now a done deal. How it is done is given to us in the following verses and chapters. All right, moving ahead. Revelation 11:18. The Goyim raged, the Gentiles raged. But your rage has come, the time for the dead to be judged, the time for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your holy people, those who stand in awe of your name, both small and great. It is also the time for destroying those who destroy the earth. We have to take this back to the two witnesses. These guys who are preaching Yeshua and the good news for three and a half years. And they were untouchable. But then they were killed once the two and three and a half years were completed. And the whole world was involved in this. The whole apostate world had been tormented by the teaching of the two witnesses preaching what they didn't want to hear. Plus all of the plagues the two were empowered to bring upon them. The emotion that the world built up against the two witnesses was rage. That's how this opens, the Goyim raged. The first statement speaks to the anger of the world and the Goyim. They celebrated the defeat of God and his two witnesses. They wanted to be free of God. Let's go to Psalm 2, 1 through 9, please. Why are the nations in an uproar? 
the people's grumbling in vain. The earth's kings are taking positions, leaders conspiring together against Adonai and his anointed. They cry, let's break their fetters, let's throw off their chains. He who sits in heaven laughs. Adonai looks at them in derision. Then in his anger he rebukes them, terrifies them in his fury. I myself have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I proclaim the decree. Adonai said to me, you are my son, today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance. The whole wide world will be your possession. You will break them with an iron rod, shatter them like a clay pot. Look how closely this parallels what we're looking at in Revelation 11:18. This prophecy is what is coming true in these next verses and chapters of Revelation. As long as we're here in the Psalms already, let's look at Psalm 98, 1 through 3, please. A new, this is a psalm. This is a psalm. A new song to Adonai because he has done wonders. His right hand, his holy arm have won him victory. Adonai has made his, known his victory, revealed his vindication in full view of nations, remembered his grace and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of earth, all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. This certainly speaks of the time that we're studying coming into being. The wrath of God and its results are doing three things. One, judging the dead. Two, rewarding the servants and the prophets and the holy people, who, those who stand in awe of God's name. And three, destroying those who destroy the earth. And these are pretty self-explanatory, and I'm not going to get into any real detail here since the coming chapters are going to deal with this in a lot of detail. There is also a summary just before the new heaven and the new earth touch down from heaven. This summary lists these same three things found here in this introduction. Let's look at Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Next I saw the great white throne and the one sitting on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing in front of the throne. The books were opened, and another book was opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged from what was written in the books according to what they had done. The sea gave up the dead in it, and the death and show gave up the dead in them, and they were judged, each according to what he had done. Then death and show were hurled into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was hurled into the lake of fire. Let's go to Revelation 11:19. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in his temple. I want you to register this into your mind because we're going to deal with something here that's complex. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, voices, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and violent hail. This is very, very interesting. The third woe is about to begin here, and the temple of God in heaven is opened up. And what is significant is the Ark of the Covenant is seen. The Ark of the Covenant is seen. Think about this. In the earthly sanctuary, this was impossible to see the Ark of the Covenant because a curtain covered that part of the temple separating the most holy place where it was from the holy place. Only the high priest would go in there, and only once a year on Yom Kippur, and he would be engulfed in a cloud of incense they also tied a rope around his leg so they could pull him out if God should decide to strike him dead for something he didn't do right. The high priest went in, in this cloud of incense, and sprinkled blood on the Ark of the Covenant. Go to Messianic Jews, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. With things so arranged, the Kohanim, the priests, go into the outer tent all of the time to discharge their duties. 
but only the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, enters the inner one, and he goes in only once a year, and he must always bring blood, which he offers both for himself and for the sins committed in ignorance, note that, by the people. By this arrangement, the Holy Spirit showed that so long as the first tent was standing, the way into the holiest place was closed, still closed off. You could not get in, the average person could not even see where the Ark of the Covenant was. The people had no direct access to God because God would have been there. The only way to God was through the priesthood. People never saw the Ark of the Covenant once the temple was in place again. Only the high priest once a year in a cloud of smoke would go into that place. When the Ark of the Covenant was behind the curtain in the most holy place, the glory of God was present, but man couldn't go into there and live, except the high priest at Yom Kippur. And here then, during the end of the age, Revelation 11.19 tells us the temple of God is opened up and the Ark of the Covenant is seen. This doesn't have much impact on Christian theology, but the impact on the Jew is immediate. The symbolism here is directed towards the people of Israel and God's covenant with them, and the fact that God's Shekinah was returned to the God of Israel. See, the fact is that in what we're looking at, we're seeing that God's Shekinah, God's glory, is returned to the people of Israel. That's what's being shown us here. The Shekinah of God rested above the Ark of the Covenant, but had been totally closed off until Israel, always until now. In the tabernacle in the desert, in the temples in Jerusalem, closed off. And this vision is a prelude to the holy war against the beast. This temple of witness will appear again and again as we move onwards towards the revelation, as we progress through the revelation. The seven angels that carry the seven bowls of God's wrath to pour out on the earth will come out of this temple, the one where the Ark of the Covenant is shown to us as being visible. This vision completes the symbols of wrath, judgment, and triumph of God as he comes against those who oppose the testimony of his Messiah, Yeshua Mashiach, and his people. This, in fact, comports with the idea that Israel will be saved. All Israel will be saved, all Israel that is living. This verse, this verse immediately precedes the holy war between God and Hasatan. This verse that we've just looked at immediately precedes the holy war between God and Satan. Now I want to plow right ahead into chapter 12, which is A, about Israel, and B, begins a capsule history of what has led up to this holy war that is about to begin in earnest. Man has given his dominion over the earth to Satan through his worship of Satan. That's the rebellion of man against what God has instructed. And this started in Genesis chapter 3. Accepting what Satan instructed amounted to worship of Satan placed him above God, and God is going to change all of this. Two great signs are given that this is going to take place, that Satan is going to be deposed from the position that he usurped. I don't know if you ever thought about them in this manner. Okay, here's the rest of the signs, and stay with me, because we're going to give you, I think, a totally new concept in most cases. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now a great sign was seen in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, 
Under her feet the moon, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and about to give birth, and she screamed in the agony of labor. All right. Are you ready for this? The woman is Israel. This woman that this is speaking of here is Israel. Focus on this. God is raising up to himself a special people who will have a special purpose. Where have we seen this language before? The sun, the moon, the twelve stars. This was in one of Joseph's dreams. This is one of Joseph's dreams that he had, that he told his father. Go to Genesis chapter 37, verses 9 through 11, please. He, Joseph, had another dream which he told his brothers. Here, I had another dream, and there were the sun, the moon, and eleven stars prostrating themselves before me. He told his father, too, as well as his brothers, but his father rebuked him. What is this dream you have had? Do you really expect me, your mother, and your brothers to come and prostrate ourselves before you on the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. The woman that we've just looked at back in, in Revelation, Israel, that is about to give birth, is about to give birth to the children of Israel. The son represents Jacob, the father of the children of Israel. The moon, the mother, or more accurately, the mothers, plural, since once we move away from the individual Joseph to the children of Israel, the eleven stars, being Joseph's brothers, include him, and you have twelve stars, who with their descendants, are we following this, are the children of Israel, through which will come Messiah, God's Redeemer. And when she, Israel, does this, produces the Messiah, it will be a great sign that God is going to take back to himself through his people that which is rightly his. Joseph's dream was also a great and powerful vision and a prophecy, a type and foreshadow, if you will. So it is, this woman, Revelation 12, 1 and 2, identifiable as the children of Israel. Think about this. Who, it happens, took the position of being the wife of God at Horeb. The Israel became the wife of God at the mountain of God when they were given the Torah. They did it by signing to the Ketubah that we call Devarim or Deuteronomy. So here we have a wife of God, Israel, who is pregnant and about to give birth. It was the individual woman, Miriam or Mary, who became pregnant through the Holy Spirit. But that represented God and his wife, Israel, producing the child, if you will, that would become the redeemer of the world. Move beyond the concept of Yeshua being only your Redeemer, your personal Redeemer, which he is. Move to the him being the world's Redeemer. That's the thing that he's going to do at his second coming. Redeem the world from whom? Satan. For all the replacement theologians out there, on the basis of this analogy that God gives us about his relationship with Israel, that Israel becomes his wife, and they produce together, the two of them, the Messiah. How can one even conceive the idea that God would abandon his wife, the mother of his child? Given his instructions concerning marriage and the immorality that surrounds marriage, God is doing what he is doing through Israel. I want everybody to think about that. God is doing what he is doing through Israel. The Gentiles are welcome to get on board, invited to get on board, urged to get on board. But God is doing what he is doing through Israel. 
Remember the saying to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Those replacement theology people, I believe, really need to get a life. The woman, Israel, about to give birth, screams in agony. Well, we could spend days going through what it took for Israel to deliver this child. We could spend more days just on the postpartum psychosis that caused Israel to abandon her son after his birth. Think about that. We could spend days just on the postpartum psychosis that caused Israel to abandon her son after his birth. The agony of labor is here. It's not so much physical pain as it is emotional trauma. All that's going on within Israel at the time of Yeshua's birth and all of the things that he is doing that are pointing to himself is creating emotional trauma. Let's go to Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the appointed time arrived, God sent forth his son. He was born from a woman, born into a culture in which legalistic perversion of the Torah was the norm. That's where Israel had gone to. They had perverted what was given to them in the Old Testament to the point where there was a culture that was simply a legalistic perversion of what God intended for them to be having and doing and knowing. A legalistic perversion of the Torah was the norm. Can you just imagine the kind of trauma that would and did place on Israel trying to give birth to her Messiah? Torah is designed to bring Israel to a point of producing her Messiah. Etch that into your minds. Torah is designed to bring Israel to the point of producing her Messiah, but at the time of his birth, perversion of the Torah had become the norm. Grace had become legalistic works. No longer the woman of Israel screamed in the agony of labor of what she was to birth. This was a traumatic thing that was happening. Note that this was a great sign in heaven. God is sending his son, born of his wife Israel. When we understand this analogy of the wife giving birth to the son, then the other analogies such as an adulterous Israel and Israel whoring on her husband probably tend to make more sense to us. The terminology in the book of Hosea, all are pictures of the journey it took to bring Israel to the point of the birth of Messiah, the Son of God, come to redeem the world. Now then, having brought you through that, and I know some of you are going to have to wade through this two or three times in order to really sort it all out, but along with this, there was another great sign that was seen in heaven. This one is, is in still, this is still now uh, Revelation 12, but we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. Revelation 12, 3 and 4. We just looked at Revelation 12, 1 and 2. Let's look at Revelation 12, 3 and 4. Another sign was seen in heaven. There was a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his heads were seven royal crowns. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of heaven and threw them down to the earth. The great red dragon here is Satan. The indication is made certain. The identification, I should say, repeat that. The identification is made certain in Revelation 12.9. On the next page, please, 12.9. The great dragon was thrown out. That ancient serpent, also known as the devil and Satan, the adversary, the deceiver of the whole world, he was hurled down to the earth and his angels were hurled down with him. The dragon, or Satan, was thrown down to the earth along with his fallen angels, who are also known as demons. And the second sign then lays out the battleground and it is the planet Earth. He is thrown down to the Earth, the battleground. And the combatants, the combatants are God's Redeemer, His Messiah, 
and is God's adversary, thrown down to the ground along with his demons, from whom the earth is going to be redeemed. The dragon is Satan. Note the description given of him here. Seven heads and ten horns and seven royal crowns. These are attributes at time to the fourth empire of man. Remember that passage in Daniel 7 where each of the four empires of man are described, described to us through comparison to a different beast? Let's go there. Daniel 7, 2 through 7, please. I had a vision at night. I saw there before me the four winds of the sky breaking out over the great sea, and the four huge animals came up out of the sea, each different from the others. The first was like a lion, but it had angel's wings. As I watched, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted off the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a human heart was given to it. Then there was another animal, a second one, like a bear. It raised itself up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up and gorge yourself with flesh. After this I looked, and there was another one, like a leopard, with four bird's wings on its sides. This animal had four heads, and it was given power to rule. After this I looked in the night visions, and there before me was a fourth animal, dreadful, horrible, extremely strong, and with great iron teeth. It devoured, crushed, and stamped its feet on what was left. It was different from all the animals that had gone before it, and it had ten horns. It had ten horns. The lion was Babylon. The bear was Medo-Persia. The leopard was the Greek empire. And this fourth empire, that was terrible and frightening beast, that had ten horns, had no beast in creation that it could be compared to or tie it to until now. The great red dragon of Revelation 12 has ten horns. The great red dragon of Revelation 12 has ten horns. Just like this one had ten horns. That great red dragon is Hasatan, the four beast that is dreadful and horrible and extremely strong, whose description is used in describing the fourth empire of man, appears to be none other than the adversary himself. Described for us in Revelation 12.3 as a great, red, a great red dragon. The ten horns are the ten kingdoms that make up the pagan empire that encompasses the entire world. The seven heads with seven royal crowns indicates that the adversary by this point will have complete control over the nations of the world. The great red dragon that is the beast of the fourth empire of man in his rebellion, the great red dragon not only affects the earth, but it affects heaven. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of heaven. These stars are angels who have rebelled against God by following the adversary, and a third of the angels in heaven have chosen to follow the adversary. The use of the tail of the dragon sweeping them out of heaven seems to show a lack of caring on the part of Satan for the welfare of these fallen angels. The sweeping tail acting in the same manner as giving someone a sweeping backhand blow that dislodges that someone from where they are. Then the language indicates that it is the dragon that throws them down to earth with the same sweep of its tail. This would be the source of the demons that Yeshua cast out of the demoniac into the swine, for instance. The demons that are held in the abyss by the Euphrates for release during the shofar judgments. And really... This could be talking about anywhere the demonic activities on earth are recorded from us, for us. I'm going to stop here. I want to stop here even though we're not quite finished with the past historical details. The next segment has really too much information to get into with our remaining time that we have here this evening. Man gave up his right to govern the earth under God which is often referred to as the original sin, did this in the book of Revelation, giving up the earth to Satan. God starts the reclamation of the earth by raising up a special people through his wife, the woman of Israel, through whom his Redeemer will be born into the earth, into the world. The great red dragon 
Hasatan takes up the challenge, sweeping a third of the angels, read demons, down to earth, which becomes the battleground of the war for the control of the earth that's going on. This is not the throwing of Satan himself out of heaven. We're going to see that in verses 7 through 9. This is the placing of the dragon's army on the earth in an attempt to strengthen his hold on the earth, defend his position on the earth, so to speak. We'll pick this up again in mid-verse 4 when we pick this up next time. So we'll close with that.